Welcome back to Bell to Bell with Bobby Blaze. This is part two of the top ten greatest territories from back in the day. I am your host, Jeremy Boogie Woogie Man Vilmer, and joining us now is Bobby Blaze, the star of the show. What's happening, Bobby? Oh, man, uh, we got a whole lot happening because we've hit these territories, and we've hit them hard. So we've got, I think, four more to go of the greatest uh, of the top ten territories. It's been a fun episode so far, and I'm just glad to be back on here, you know, getting on, trying to knock out these in the last four. It's just, it's just been a blast, really, going through these. We mentioned how many other territories, you know, so many honorable mentions we, we could throw out there. Um, at one time, I know uh, 38, 40 territories at one time, then other places around the world as well. But it's, um, yeah, we're down to the last four, man. So uh, how about if I real briefly just name uh, 10 through 5, and we'll go from there if that's okay. Sounds like a plan to me, by golly. Hey, all right. Well, we started off, we did give some, like I said, some honorable mentions, just some places um, like out in the Maritimes and and some places um, like, you know, other places in Japan and Puerto Rico and, uh, which, go ahead and say it. I know you don't like mentioning that. Well, uh, it's, you know, it, it, it's a very specific thing. I don't have anything against Puerto Rican people or the island right. of Puerto Rico. It's, it is very specifically, it appeared to have been very corrupt during a murder investigation of uh, Brody. And, you know, just yeah. fuck those guys because they let them just all I agree. cross point fingers uh, and everybody walk free. But there was Germany, you know, Otto Watts ran the territory mm-hmm. over Germany for two and three months at a time where they ran pretty much the same cities, from my understanding, for eight and ten weeks at a time running tournaments. And then also uh, uh, Mexico and just all kinds of different places around the world you could work. And uh, we we took in consideration all the ones that you could work back in the day in the U.S. of those territories, and we got it down to our top ten. And so coming in at number ten was Smoky Mountain Wrestling. And um, I could have put it higher, but we're going to just put it right there and keep it at number 10. (laughs) Number 9 was Portland. That was a really good territory. Number 8 was Stampede. We had a lot of good things to say about Stampede and those nice road trips. Um, Number 7 was your favorite territory at one time, I know, was WCCW, the World Class Championship Wrestling. Had some tremendous talents, tremendous money was being made. And just a uh, lot, lot of good shows through there, man. A lot of guys coming through there. Number six, I started watching back in like 1981, and that was Georgia Championship Wrestling with the uh, Superstation coming on. TBS started coming on, so we started getting that. And we finished up with number five, uh, Championship Wrestling from Florida. And both of us, I think most mostly what we knew about it being not from there, was what we saw in the magazines, or we eventually saw on some VHS tapes. Um, and then I got to, fortunately, when I lived there, I got to see quite a bit uh, of the latter part of it um, uh, before it you know, completely shut down. Yep. But I did get to see a lot of talent that come through Florida. And that's going to take us to our number four, and we're going to pick up our show from there. So there's 10 through 4, or 10 through 5, rather, and we're going to finish up today on part two with the top four territories of all time for professional wrestling from back in the day, the territory days. Indeed. And yeah, we, you know, we, we tend to sometimes with the top 10 list, we can dig ourselves into a hole pretty quickly. And that's what's happened. What's happened here. Cause there are things that we can expand on for a while. And, uh, you know, the goal is our show has always been planned around a 45 minute, 50 minute runtime, you know, long enough to mow your lawn or drive to work. That sort of thing. So we are trying to refocus on that, and we may have to go. I know sometimes we may have to do top five lists instead of top ten. So yes. th- these are things we are considering as we move forward, and we are trying to get ourselves back on a regular schedule. So again, I want to thank everybody who's uh, uh, everybody who's been hanging in there with us. We do appreciate it, and uh, you know, keep coming back. We promise to get our shit together pretty quickly here. Yes. And if you follow us on Twitter, you can follow Jeremy at the Geekish Cast. <clears throat> you can follow me at Bobby Blaze 744 And you can also follow our joint account that Jeremy and now built built over 1,600 loyal followers at the Bell to Bell Blaze. Uh, and that's a, a joint account. A lot of times Jeremy will put Jeremy or Jay or I'll put BB out there uh, on some of the comments we make. We have been getting a lot of good feedback uh, from our loyal listeners, and we appreciate you guys hanging in there. 
we haven't tried to deceive anyone. We told everyone our schedules had changed. Uh, we just keep telling people, hold on, you know, we'll get back to a regular schedule. But we are, you know, we have episodes coming out, so stay with us. And uh, with that said, I'd like to say um, the uh, the people that do follow us and the people we do give shout outs to, we appreciate it because you have believed in us enough to keep retweeting. And if you've paid attention to Twitter, Twitter's made some change, I guess, with these bots now. They've cut back if you've lost any uh, followers. Uh, they've been, you can't put uh, at so and so, like at the Geekish Cast for a, a, a future. You have to do them live. You can't do a pre destined, uh, what am I trying to say? Pre term, pre timed. Um, a programmed. A programmed, yeah. You can't, so I have to cut back on mine. So if you haven't seen a lot, it's not just because Jeremy and I have cut back. Uh, it's just because that's, Twitter has cut back. And uh, it'll be back up soon, running you know, full speed again. It hasn't been shut down or anything, thankfully. But it's just one of those things where they're really watching a lot of accounts now. And they're getting rid of a lot of bots, I guess. And so uh, you pretty much have to do Twitter Live, which is the way it should be anyway. But every once in a while, I used to send out a, you know, some pre pre-tweeted uh, tweets, and that way it could kind of keep you alive. But thank you very much for staying with us. And, again, follow us on Twitter. And also I know we got a um, – and I'm not over there, but Jeremy is. There's a Facebook page and a Facebook group. And I, I encourage you to, to go visit that as well as he's trying to get that active. Um, I'm just not a big Facebook person. Um, and that's just my personal choice. And also there is a YouTube page. It's uh, – Tex runs that. That's the old buddy Jack. Got to give him a uh, shout out there. It's the um, uh, Bell to Bell Blaze podcast, I think, exactly how he has his. So, anyways, a lot of stuff out there you can find. And um, just stay with us, and we appreciate it. And uh, if you follow us on iTunes, you know, leave us a review, leave us a five star review, uh, and, and write something nice about us, you know. Uh, even if it's, hey, that one guy's country as hell. I don't know. I think they, <laughs> I think they thought you were too, and you said, well, I do live out in the country. So <laughs> anyway. Well, I don't uh, I don't live in the country, but my my people were country. Yeah, you know? there you go. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. anyway, with that said, thank you folks for tuning back in with us. And uh, tell a friend we will back on we will be back on a regular schedule soon. But in the meantime, we will be doing episodes as well. So. Um, that's all good, and that's all, you know, just glad to be recording, man. And yeah. we're ready for number four, I think. We are, as soon as I tell everybody, if you haven't done so yet, Christmas is coming, you need to get off your ass and go buy a couple copies of Bobby's books. They're available on Amazon. Oh, Bobby, what's the name of your first book? I'm all okay. stuck today. So there's, there's <laughs> let me think, let me make one up real quick. Yeah. No, uh, Pin Me, Pay Me, Have Boots Will Travel. That's my first book, and I can think you can get that at uh, <laughs> tinyurl blazebook1. Is that correct? tinyurl.com slash blazebook1. See, I'll fuck that part up. Okay, so the book called Pin Me, Pay Me, how can I get it? <laughs> they can go to tinyurl.com slash blazebook1. Takes you right to Amazon, doesn't cost you anything extra, and me and Bobby get a couple pennies put back into the show. There you go. And number two book is The Education of... I kicked out on two, The Education of a Wrestler. And you can get that at... tinyurl.com slash blazebook2. And you do have a, a collection of, what, Christmas short stories on there right now? Yes. There's a, a Yard Time, which is also in, in the second book, but it comes as a single story. And I have a, a Christmas story on there right now. It's called Seasons Up and Greetings. Um, my best Christmas ever, and it's a little humorous story about when I was younger, and um, it's only two ninety nine, um, and I'm not sure how that works uh, on getting kickbacks from that, but uh, download the damn thing anyway. But I know in the books, at least Jeremy gets some kickback, and I get some kickback off the books, and uh, and you know, here's the whole thing: it's, it's not a whole lot of money, whether I sell one or whether Jeremy gets some kickback, but it just keeps the show going uh, with our, uh, with our hosting fees. And it just it serves as great motivation, too, that, you know, hey, man, um, you know, I listen to a guy, and I think I'll read his book. And then, then he listen to him and talk to his buddy every Saturday or every Sunday or whatever time of the week you listen to the show. And you say, man, I, them, them guys are all right. I, you know, I'm, I'm with it, man. I'm glad I went there and went to the tiny URL backslash hash 
points, dots, you know, <laughs> whatever, and bought the damn book and helped those guys out because we're pretty good guys. If you ask us, we'll tell you. <laughs> exactly. Bobby, I got I to gotta start worrying about your, your use of technology because you're kind of sounding like my great-grandparents when they were afraid to miss the TV with the remote because they didn't want to <laughs> set anything on fire back in the 70s. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Oh, yeah, you just smart me up, man. That's all there is to it. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I'm getting to that age where I sound like a buffoon when I try to talk about the interwebs and the Twitters and the tweets <laughs> and the whatnot. But anyhow, let's get on with this shit, shall we? Yes, we shall. Get off this shit show. <laughs> no, it's a great show. It's just that uh, I'm stumbling over my own words. And I'm not even drinking yet. Maybe that's the problem. <clears throat> so, uh yeah, good shot might do me some good. Might wait but me anyway, up and clear the cobwebs. Let's go with number four, okay? And I had it as uh, CWA Memphis, but basically it's just uh, Memphis Pro Wrestling. And of course, that come out of Memphis, Tennessee. And I'm, we're talking, and of course, there's been a lot of wrestling out of Memphis, Tennessee. But we're mainly talking about the one that we grew up on. Um, that was an a NWA affiliate from 1977 through 86. And in 87, I think they become an AWA affiliate. We're talking about Jerry Jarrett and uh, Eddie Marlin, uh, Jerry the King Lawler, Lance Russell, uh, the whole uh, people, the Jackie Fargo's, Sputnik Monroe's, all those guys that come through that great territory. Uh, when Andy Kaufman came through there at one time, and we're just talking about a one of the last great territories that actually ran, you know, seven nights a week and sometimes twice on Saturdays and Sundays. They had a weekly schedule. They did live TV for over 40 years, if I'm not mistaken. Every Saturday, they were live in Memphis. And uh, I think they had 300,000 metropolitan uh, Memphis metropolitan area listeners, uh, or watchers, rather, TV watchers, uh, <clears throat> and did it. They... From my understanding, you know, I sent the tape around uh, to hear Cornette talk about, I think it called Bicycle it Around, where they put it on a Greyhound or someone would take it to the next town, the next TV, and they would follow the tape around. So wherever it aired out, um, whether it be Louisville, like they did, um, uh, the schedule was Memphis was on Monday night, Louisville was on Tuesday, Evan. Evansville, Indiana was on Wednesday. Uh, Lexington, Kentucky was every third Thursday. They had some other dates, uh, some towns on Thursdays. Friday, I think you were back in um, uh, maybe a spot show, I'm not sure, somewhere close around Memphis to do uh, the uh, Memphis TV taping on a Saturday morning. And then you did Nashville on a Saturday night. And then you had a spot show or two on a Sunday. So you could see they did a lot, a lot of miles. And Anyone, as any, everyone in wrestling, or became someone in wrestling, went through the Memphis area at one point or another. It was just a great, great territory, and um, just a, a whole cast of characters that came through there, um, star after star, uh, people that had different names, and they come back under a mask, and Lord, they had, you know, this feud after feud, and... It was just, uh, you know, you had everything from the first family of professional wrestling, Jimmy Hart, to, uh, you know, Jim Cornette making his, uh, started off as a photographer there. And you had uh, uh, Ricky and Robert, the Gibson brothers. And then eventually you had uh, Ricky uh, Gibson left. Um, and they teamed Ricky Morton with Robert Gibson to be formed a Rock and Roll Express. Um, you know, I mean, it's just one story after another. But it was a great territory, apparently, to work. And uh, from my understanding, I saw a couple paychecks. And, uh, you know, I know it didn't pay well as far as what you get per night at, at, at certain times. But at other times, people were making huge money back in the day. And a lot of times where they made the money at was off the gimmick wars, the gimmick tables. And as um, Cornette's got a book called uh, rags, papers, and pens about the merchandising tables of Memphis. And one of the things that was said was about Sputnik Road. I thought it was funny. Uh, the baby faces started leaving the rooms to go up to uh, the concession area and it said uh, Sputnik Monroe, Monroe referred to it as they're out there peddling their rags, papers, and pens. So they're gimmicks. 
and that's where a lot of guys made their money. But they drew some big houses, and a lot of guys, you know, came through there and drew some big money uh, to travel. Um, you know, it wasn't too bad from, uh, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, from going from um, uh, Louisville, or, uh, Nashville, Evansville, some of those towns. Some of the spot shows may have been out there. I think the hardest thing was being somewhere on a, uh, from my understanding, was being somewhere on a Friday night and having to be at that TV taping on that Saturday morning and then hustle over and get to Nashville for a live show that night. Uh, and then wherever you was at on Sunday, but it wasn't it wasn't overly bearing. But they did a shitload of miles, but they got paid and got compensated very well for it. Uh, even in the down times, I know Robert Gibson told me that, uh, and I love this saying. He said uh, when he worked in Memphis, when it was when it was bad, it was good, and when it was good, it was great. So um, I think that speaks of volumes for the kind of money that you know is coming through. Even even when it was bad, it was still good. Yeah. So uh, yeah, and that's what I grew up watching was Memphis wrestling. Yes, I you know I had heard of it, and I remember seeing like you know stuff on Letterman and things when I was a kid. The big I mean the big blow up periods in Memphis were really the Lawler Hurt uh, family feud. And then when Andy Kaufman came in, I mean, in the 80s, those were like, that's what really made Memphis Memphis at the time. Of course, it had always been a huge part of the wrestling world. You know, uh, yeah. you know, back in the day, the early days of wrestling, wrestling was a very different thing. And 80% of your matches were tag matches with like one or two singles matches used to promote the tag matches here and there. You would never see that now, and it's kind of a shame. Uh, but you know, yeah. the, the Andy Kaufman coming in, he was hot. He was on taxi before he got fired. That made it a huge deal. So for me, I didn't get to see a lot of the stuff itself until it was put up on Amazon, which you can go on Amazon now and see like the greatest hits of Memphis wrestling. Yeah. The other important thing for me about, uh, Memphis is they had, for me, there are two top Mike men in pro wrestling. Yeah. There's Gordon Sully and there's Lance Russell. Then there's everybody else. Yes, sir. And they had Lance Russell. Uh, matter of fact, I stole our sign off from Lance Russell. So, <laughs> yeah, and that's um, the voice of Memphis wrestling. I mean, that's, he had sidekick Dave Brown in there, and it's one of those things, almost like one of those comedies, uh, the Disney comedies back in the day when uh, you know Lance is talking. What do you say about that, Dave? And Dave would start to say something. No sooner he got two words. <laughs> that's right, Dave, and, he, and then Lance would right back to con the, the match again barely letting them get anything in, but nonetheless, they worked together as a good team, but the voice was Lance Russell, man, and they treated it with such respect. We talked about that during the uh, the uh, Funk and Lawler match in the empty arena. I mean, he treated it like, you know, uh, that and the concession stand, you know, everything. He, he It was real, you know, and that's oh, yeah. the way he presented it, and that's the way it should have been presented, and uh, didn't put up with, uh, you know, hey, Get Eddie Marlin out here, someone you know, or or whatever. I mean, or get these guys out of here. Someone come here and separate them. He didn't. It was no nonsense. Um, you know, he he really tried to. He 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 got it across as an athletic, competitive, and they done some crazy ass angles in Memphis, man. You know, that old Tennessee wrestling man. They but he got them across. So yeah. Oh yeah, no, and they, you're right. They did not hold back on gimmicks. They went fucking nuts on some of that stuff. But, yeah, more importantly, back in the day, people who treated wrestling like a sport, guys like Lance Russell, Gordon Soley, um, you know, there, there were a handful of guys in the AWA who did it. That made it feel much realer. And now, yeah. you know, now they treat it like a cartoon most everywhere you watch it. So it's you can see a difference in the presentation and how it matters. And even their bumper music when they went to and from commercials in uh, the CWA, yeah. Made it feel like you were watching some grand spectacle. Absolutely. Also, I just love studio wrestling. There's something about it that I like the look of. It's, it's so it's I I don't know if you could ever go back to that look, um, but I tell you, I'm with you, man. I did not mind one bit when I watched Georgia Championship Wrestling, and you're sitting there watching it from you know wherever uh, CNN Center or. Uh, if you're watching Memphis and you're downtown there um, at the TV station, it's just something about it, man. Um, even uh, I think the old Detroit had a tape going around at one time that had the studio wrestling. And I'm sure there's others I'm leaving out, but but I'm with you, man. You got like 25 to 75 people in a studio and uh, 
giving out free tickets. I'm sure kids lined up, everyone lined up outside that building before that show went live. And it was just one of those things. Hell, it like probably like been on um, Mr. Cartoon or or Captain Chesapeake or Captain Kangaroo or one of them guys, man, for them kids. It's just, but hell, this was people that were going, that was everything from kids, from adults to the, to young, good looking women, you mm-hmm. know, they paying out the audience and, and uh, usually a couple guys out there, it's uh, pretty big, like, uh, you know, they either in trainer or thinking, I want to get into this wrestling myself, you know, but there was always just that whole, and it's that whole, uh, I don't know, man. Maybe it's just uh, more me being sentimental when you said that, but it's just there's there's a vibe to it, man. It's something cool about it. You yeah, know? Well, it makes it feel accessible. It makes. I mean, I remember when I saw um, John Lee Hooker play. I got so close to him at the Catalyst in Santa Cruz that if I'd stuck my arm out, I could have touched his shoe. Yeah. And there's something about being that close to the action. You know, I went and yeah. saw went and saw APW in Hayward with my kid a couple times. And yeah. you're, you know, they, they did it in a warehouse, and you're in a garage, basically, and you're right up against the ring. And when the villain champion turns around and spits into the crowd, it hits somebody, <laughs> you know? There you go, yeah. Yeah. Well, I saw Memphis Wrestling several times. I never got to go to the studio uh, wrestling, but uh, they come to Ashland, uh, sold out, uh, pretty much like I told a story about Georgia Championship Wrestling. Uh, Ashland and Memphis is a oh, band. It's a, it's, well, I want to say eight, nine hours difference, but we did get their TV out of Lexington every Saturday, and they came, and they sold the place out, and it was we were right there on top of it, you know, right there in the crowd, you know, like you're like you're talking about because it's at the National Guard Armory. But then when I was in college, I got to go to several times to uh, the Rupp Arena on Thursday night shows, mm-hmm. and uh, I was about midway up through there. Rupp, Rupp is just huge. I mean, it holds twenty three thousand people for basketball. But um, I know they did really good. They didn't sell it out, of course. Uh, but they did real good business in Lexington. Um, and I'd be about, oh, mid-arena, mid-ring. And you, you're not, like, right on top of because, you know, I had, like, 20 feet back from the ring because you're in a big arena. But the feeling of it was still really good. It was, it was still, at that point, I uh, used the word earlier, accessible maybe. It, you, you still felt like you were, like, right there with, you know, the confines of being a professional wrestling show. You wasn't up in, you know, top of fucking some big ass skyscraping building trying to look down and see two little ants down there wrestling. You could actually see, you know, when Jimmy Hart and the San Diego Chicken come out and wrestled, uh, Jerry Lawler and, uh, uh, Jesse Ventura, uh, was with, uh, I think he was with the, uh, he brought in, um, Ventura was, was teaming with uh, Jimmy Hart, and then Lawler had the chicken or vice versa, however it went. But, you know, it's like it was right there, man, for the event. So uh, just that good, good good atmosphere, you know. Yeah, absolutely. All right, yeah. let's, uh, let's right. go ahead and keep moving here, and let's yep, talk about do. number three, the yeah. American Wrestling Association. Oh, yeah. Okay, so um, it was sometime in the 60s. When whatever they called it at the time, Vern Gagne's wrestling promotion decided that Vern Gagne should be champion. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I kind of love the way the story goes, and my head's all foggy this morning, so I can't. Was Buddy Rogers the uh, NWA champion at the time? Am I thinking wrong? I, I, I'm thinking you're thinking right. <laughs> okay, so the AWA withdrew their membership from the NWA, but declared that the NWA world champion was also the AWA world champion and gave him 60 days to defend the title against Vern Gagne, which did not happen. So they Triple H the belt right to Vern Gagne, and there was a start <laughs> of the AWA. Yeah, <laughs> and that's what I had. It was uh, founded by Vern Gagne and uh, was it Wally Carbo? Mm-hmm. Then owned by Vern, and I guess it ran from 1960 to 1991 uh, under the uh, American Wrestling Association. And that was always one of those things when you got the magazines back in the day, too, as one of your top three. And, and people probably could see where our list is going from here. But that was a big, big territory. It's based out of uh, Minneapolis. They had TV. But they went up into Canada to Winnipeg. They went, uh, shoot. They went all over uh, Iowa, um, San Francisco. Minnesota. Yeah, all the way up to San Francisco. That's right. Yeah. You're right. Uh, they they had a a pretty big, a pretty large territory, and like I said, I think um, I mentioned earlier the um, 
uh, Memphis got involved with them in like 87 or so when they started doing some things with, uh, uh, with a Lawler and Mr. Perfect and, um, uh, I believe to, someone that, there, the best ghost, some of those guys, but yeah. they, they mostly, you know, um, didn't come down that far into Kentucky, but they, they traveled quite a while. I think they went, what, Indianapolis. They went down eventually down into that area, Chicago. Um, they had some pretty big towns. Oh, they had a, they had a pretty good lock on the center of the country. Yeah. But you know, like you were, you know, we were saying there, like when big time started to close up, AWA, you know, inherited that part of the country. So they came to central and northern california through that um you know they also had in the early 80s late 70s early 80s awa had the big names you know yeah. that's where hulk hogan and bobby heenan and like all the people when you think of pro wrestling those guys started with the awa in a lot of time a lot of cases yes um you know the guys that vince made big when he started the, you know, when he took it over from his dad and, and started running his direction, a lot of the talent he picked up was from the AWA to the point where what Vince was doing was he was sniping their talent away from the AWA and then running shows in their territories with their talent. Yeah. Yeah. And also, you know, back in the days when um, they needed a wrestler on TV, they went to Nick Bockwinkle in the 60s and early 70s. And he was an AWA fixture. Yeah. And we've talked about him, what a great champion he was, how elegant he was in his interviews, great body, and what a tremendous worker he was. So you couldn't go wrong using Nick Bockwick on any show. No. They put, I remember seeing him on the Monkees a few years ago and just being like, holy shit, is that a young Nick Bockwick? <laughs> yeah, I think you reminded me about that. Yeah. That's pretty funny. But yeah, they, uh, they had a lot of talent, man, a lot of talent uh, come through there. And, you know, those, I'm sure, uh, I don't have a fact for this, and, and people can fact check. I'm sure they had some towns that weren't too far, you know, outside of uh, Minneapolis, but also I'm sure they had some hellacious road trips, too, because I heard a, a couple of interviews of some of the guys that would travel uh, back when they were first training. Uh, man, they would travel, you know, four to eight hours every night. And have to sit the ring up, then wrestle, tear the ring down, and you know, travel to it. Yeah, keep moving, and they did, and so they put some miles out there. As far as money goes, I guess at one point they were all making pretty good money, and I guess at the end there, I come down to Hogan, uh, one of his deal final deal breakers was over some T-shirts, I guess, Burn and him buttered heads over some T-shirt money. It was or wasn't there, or whatever, or, and that was his final. Uh, one of the legend or story, you know, one of the final straws of, well, you know, I'll just work for Vince then or whatever, WWF at the time or whatever, because, um, you know, he felt like he should have been getting more money off his T-shirts. And he was probably right. And um, and maybe Vern, you know, could have kept it around. The other thing was, you know, about the Internet, that's, that was the thing. You could bring those guys around if you needed someone. Um, they may be an AWA star, but they could have been working on an NWA show and vice versa because of the territory overlap sometime. And you might see a guy that was under a hood, and you're thinking, uh, you know, you may or may not know who it was. But um, and then again, you may see a guy working as himself and say, hey, I just saw that guy working for, you know, the NWA last month. And that may have been the case. He might have filled in for someone and picked up a paycheck because ultimately we all were independent contractors. And I think I told you I saw in uh, January of uh, 85 in Baltimore, um, I saw Sergeant Slaughter working one show for the um, WWF. And another show the next month for the uh, NWA, and he wrestled uh, uh, Flair, and I think that was in February of '85, <clears throat> if I'm not mistaken. But that was over the GI Joe type gimmick. I guess he had had some kind of a deal already on his own, uh, you know, whatever. So here he is working for two different companies in the same city, a month apart, you know. Oh yeah. Uh, for two different companies, I mean, same city rather. So, um, but yeah, AWA, man, that, that was a thing back in, didn't have the internet, we had them after magazines, and you'd have the rankings in the back, you know, always had AWA, and then a few more we haven't talked about yet, but um, they always had those, and you would see those guys, you know, fan favorites, they was always mixed up in there, uh, most hated, you know, managers, uh, a lot of AWA guys were on those lists and was either on a cover or had to, had to fold out 
the pinup or whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, stories about them. It was, it was a big, big deal at one time. Oh yeah. So, well, they, I, I also give them credit. AWA focused on technical wrestling until they couldn't get away with it anymore. Basically that was really the focus of their shows and style. I think they had one of the best looking world titles of all time. It looked like the kind of belt that you would see in a prize competition like boxing or something else. It wasn't trying to be overly flashy or too design heavy. It just looked like something, a prize that people would fight over, you know? And that's the thing, a prize that people would fight over. Yeah. That's what the belt should be. And that's something about, real quickly, um, during the match, you don't see enough guys that keep it competitive like you used to. And I'm not making a knock on today's product. I'm just saying, when guys would wrestle all their own, you was talking about how they were still competitive and, and, and did it as long as they could as far as the wrestling until they had to go in a little bit different direction. They were still keeping competitive. Guys were going for pins, you know. They yeah. were going to – or submissions uh, before the guy got to the rope and stuff because the competition was if you win, you win more money – or you move up the card to get a chance at that belt. And I know I'm telling just an elementary story, but that's the way it should be because if it's competitive, why would you want to just get beat every week or not have comp uh, competitive matches every week? And why would you not want to have a chance for a title shot? And why would you not want to have a belt that looks like, hey, I want to win that, you know? Yeah, exactly. So, uh, that, that, I don't know, sometimes it's just so simple. It's elementary, like I said, but we tend to forget that sometimes, and um, people get away from that. And um, I like spending my the suspension of my disbelief or of my belief that, hey, man, they're really trying to pin each other. They're really trying to make each other submit, and they're really trying to win that title because if you win that title, you're going to win more money or earn more money, if you will. So, yeah, props to the AWA, man. I think that's a great number three. Me too. Well, let's go on to number two. Yes. All right. Um, we were talking about the Worldwide Wrestling Federation, the World Wrestling Federation, World Wrestling Entertainment. Uh, the last man standing for many, many years in pro wrestling. Yep. Uh, and I had it written down that way, too. I had it all, all of those initials spelled out like that, I guess. And I had Capital Sports and uh, just the whole, yeah, the last man standing for Almost 20 years, yeah. right? Until until just the last couple of years, really, they they went through a thing. And but I'm not going to sit here and shit on the product. No. We, we you don't last that long, um, and you know doing something that they've changed the, the wording, they changed the title, they they do this, they do that, they do a more cartoonish type style than what I like. But the bottom line is. Is it's the largest wrestling company in 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 the world, you know, and um, they have their own network. They do. Good Lord, how many stars? And I'm not just talking about there. There are wrestlers that come through there that were just wrestlers that all of a sudden became superstars and also crossed over and are still crossing over to mainstream and oh, yeah. TV and movies and magazines. and Well, you know, and, Edge, uh, Edge is on that TV show Vikings now. Yeah, I think you told me that. Yeah. I was not aware yeah. of that. You told the, me, yeah. the Rock might be one of the biggest action heroes of all time. Uh, he, he probably will end up being yeah. uh, if he doesn't decide to run for president. Uh, no, I don't think he will in 2020, but um, 2024 maybe. You know, I don't know if he's done making his movies yet, but I'm telling you what, that's that's the rumors. I don't know if he will or not, but man, right now he is the most popular, you know, action hero, biggest movie star out there right now. And he may be bigger than all of them in the end. Who knows? Yeah. But um, man, that company and they packed them in, you know, all through all through the ages. I mean, I know they had their ups and downs as far as you know, um, you know, big shows, little shows, whatever, but. It, they were always, not every show was a sellout, but even when they ran, you know, just little house shows, hell, they had three teams going out to on the road, A, B, and C teams. Yeah. So they might be in three different towns. And one town may have been a sellout. The other one might have been, you know, uh, two-thirds filled. And the other one may have been at a high school gym somewhere, you know, of 200 people. But they were still running. 
And the thing about this, I was just reading this the other day. This this just actually came up during something I was looking up, um, and it was about the WWE, and it really had nothing to do with it. it had something to do more with what you was talking about last week about um, the, the wrestling people associate all the magnets go to WWE. Yes, put, you know, instead of separate the two. But one thing I was reading, I can't think of what I, honestly, I was reading an article, it was just something I was reading, opened up on Twitter, it was non-wrestling related, but it threw a reference out there and it said, it talked about how many uh, jobs Vince McMahon created um, because of his wrestling company, is pretty much what it said, and I thought that's kind of neat, because you got to think about that, he's put... Uh, people to work, not just the professional wrestlers. And I'm glad because I've always said those people that make it out there, you see on TV, I'm not going to be the armchair quarterback and watch it on Monday and shit on Tuesday or whatever. I'm just, you know, I just, if I want to watch a match, I will. If I don't, I won't. But uh, the bottom line is he's got all the wrestlers that he has, at least all those guys that are wanting to be wrestlers and have a chance to be wrestlers. Uh, they've got jobs, and that's great. And that's not counting, though, the TV people that want to be in TV that he's helping. Uh, writers, you know, uh, creative writers, creative writing teams. Sound guys, network. lighting guys. Oh, that's where I was going with yeah. exactly the whole production thing. And not only that, um, the, the, the other thing was, and again, this article really didn't have anything to do with wrestling. I think it was more, I hate to, I'm going to go ahead and use the word because it's not with it. It, it was an entertainment article. But what it was talking about is when they come to town, all those, uh, the arenas, you know, that, that gives that town another event for that month. And you've got all your concession workers to, uh, you know, concession stand workers to, to the um, uh, local, um, uh, fuck, uh, I'll well, just say maintenance. You know the word. Yeah, maintenance, so maintenance tutorial, the, security. Uh, I mean, everything. The union, the local unions. I'm yep. sorry. That's why I was trying to spit out oh, the local sorry, union yeah. guys. Yeah, I was trying to get – you got those guys that come out that do the lighting and the um, and all that stuff. So it brings work to that town for that one or two days. And hell, during a mania, I guess they're in town for all week or so, maybe 10 days. I don't even know how long they're in town for. I just know they, they have so many damn events around it. But anyway, it brings money – to the community or to that city. And um, th that's a damn good thing right there, too. So that's another reason. Um, it's not why we don't have them at number one. It's just because we'll have other reasons we get there. But as you said, WWF, WWF, and WWE, uh, deservingly to be number two position very easily, could have been number one, but we this is our list, and we're doing our personal favorites. But hell, they uh, you know from WrestleMania to Survivor Series to to fucking uh, doing you know monthly pay per views to now doing a network uh, that that you don't have to even pay for a damn pay per view. You can just get a you can get it free for your I think it's one up. I don't know if it's nine ninety nine a month now, but you can get a shitload of stuff that's out there, including Smoky Mountain Wrestling and Mid South Wrestling and and some of the wrestling that we've talked about on this uh, podcast that um, you can get through their network. So, um, you know, hats off to them, man. Oh, yeah. And more power to them, you know. Look, I mean, uh, you know, we can make arguments either way, whether what they did was good, bad, or indifferent. Everybody, yeah. everybody knows how you and I feel. One thing I think that I need to point out sometimes is that you and I will always say, look, we didn't like the cartoony shit they did in the Northeast. But you know who did like it? The people in the Northeast. That's yeah. That's why it caught on there. So, I mean, they are always catching lightning in a bottle. I'm going to give them that. And you know what? I, I can shit on them, but you know what, Bobby? Neither one of us got rich running a wrestling promotion. <laughs> right. You know, that's the thing. We have that big rant, and you can find it on the YouTube. Uh, and it, we just have fun. We had fun with the rant, and, and I think it was a very sincere rant. And But we never once discouraged anyone from not watching their product. Uh, we told you, hell, go out if that's what you like, go out and watch it and enjoy it, and I, and I still stand by that. And the other thing is, man, Madison Square Garden, every month for years, they ran that, and that's that's incredible. You know, mm -hmm. you're, you're doing, you talk about, we went back to Memphis, and, uh, you know, they, they ran a Mid-South Coliseum, and I'm, I'm sure, you know, please, every, everywhere had somewhere, you know, whether it be back, we went talked talk to, early on about the Olympic Auditorium was the, uh, the West Coast uh, answer to the, supposed to be the West Coast answer to Madison Square Garden, but hell, it's still 
the, you know, probably the most famous sports arena there is in uh, Madison Square Garden, and they sold it out, you know, month after month after month for years and years and years. So um, right there in the biggest, you know, in New York, New York, you know, what are you going to do? If you could, if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere, right? That's, so That's what they say, they, my God. They did stuff, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, well, let's um, let's keep running so yep, we can stop kissing running. Vince's ass here a little bit. Yeah, hell, he ain't sending us anything, is he? <laughs> no. It kind of leaves a bad taste in my mouth, but, you know. Um, let's go to number one. Bobby, do you want to introduce this one? Sure, I'll introduce it. I want to introduce it as... as JCP, uh, Jim Crockett Promotions, slash NWA, if that's okay, um, because it was Jim Crockett Promotions, and they were a member of the NWA, and they were based out of Charlotte, North Carolina, and that's why we're coming from Greensboro, North Carolina, home of Star K, the very first, the granddaddy, the supercar, uh, of all supercards back in the day, well, back in 1983, I think. So, um, yeah, we selected Jim, Crock promo- Jim Crockett Promotions uh, slash NWA territory there um, as our number one greatest territory to work for. And I think it had a combination to do with several things. Uh, Jeremy will give you some of his, but mine was just the stories I've heard and, and seen the, the wrestling shows that I got to watch once the NWA started coming to my area. Uh, within a two-hour driving distance of Columbus, Ohio, a half an hour to uh, uh, Huntington, West Virginia, an hour to uh, Charleston, West Virginia. And I started seeing all these guys that I'd seen on TV, and they started getting, when NWA, when the horsemen got hot, and just that whole time period for me, man, it's just uh, from way back when, back in, I think it was uh, uh, 19... If I'm not mistaken, 1935, um, something I read uh, from uh, uh, Tim Hornbecker, uh, his book. He's got a new book out now. Uh, this this was from an older book of his, uh, but it was about um, that Jimmy Crockett uh, basically became a millionaire just working out of his home. Then he eventually started working out of uh, uh different restaurants, you know, yep. until he finally got a little studio and he always kept his, or a little uh, office, and he always kept his cost down. But, man, the talent they had there. Um, and uh, while I mentioned, I guess, uh, Tim Hornbecker, T- Tim Hornbecker's got that, a new book called uh, The Death of the Territories. Just want to drop that out there. So if you want to check that out, um, it's on my wish list. I haven't gotten it yet, but I, I've heard nothing but great things about it. So that can be our book of the week also. Oh, I go. just got that off the uh, Mid-Atlantic Gateway Archives, uh, just an article he had written about how he started off. Uh, probably started in 90, 1933, but he went officially in 1935 and ran uh, through the 50th anniversary uh, in 1985 with uh, still special cars throughout the years and um, some of the towns they ran, and I like that because the, I like hearing some of the stories. So, you know, you could Charlotte, you could work every town and pretty much either get on a plane, and I guess they had two planes, and be back home that evening in Charlotte, or in some cases they'd be 90 miles away, um, say in uh, uh, Richmond, Virginia, and then somewhere maybe Winston-Salem and this and that, and the boys would still stay over just because it was such a fun time. They was having you know, special meetings after the matches and things, you know. Uh, I'm sure at certain hotels and, and uh, motels and uh, just uh, and the, and the talent, though, man, and the TV product that when you got to watch, when you watched, you know, the – we got a got kind of got a double shot of them there when when the guys got to work both for Georgia Championship and for the when that show came on and also when the um, uh, Jim Crockett uh, NWA show came on and you got to see some of these great great stars man it was just uh, it was just something special um, because as you mentioned earlier the cartoon wrestling um, and that's not a dig towards anyone in the Northeast that that liked it that caught on up there. And like that, what you mentioned with the AWA, the NWA was right there with trying to keep it as competitive as possible as long as they could. And it, it could get a lot away with it. And um, the angles was were, were all very believable. Um, and a, a lot of them seemed real personable, you know, personal rather. And, and that, that adds to the, the believability of it. 
as we've talked about. So um, that that got my vote as the number one territory to work for. Uh, I know the guys were making money hand over fist at one time, uh, you know, working for them. And then uh, we also know <clears throat> all through there, just from the seeing the TV, whether you watch TV, you got the magazines, whether you went to the arenas, if they come to your area, um, man, those guys just uh, top of the line talent up and down the up and down a card, up and down a card, nothing but talent. Oh, yeah. So, well, that was my reasoning. Yeah, well, JCP, um, you know, Jim Crockett, like you were saying, he used to run wrestling, plays, concerts, you know, yeah. just he, he promoted everything. So he was a guy who was trying to run all over the place. Um, you know, what they owned a minor league team, I believe. I was going to say a baseball team, yes. Yeah. And so it stayed as a family business up until about the end of the 80s. Uh, when they couldn't compete because it, they just they took on too much. They they had too much out in play for a f- small family business to try to run. Um, that's as I understand it. But yeah, you got to look at the guys that were there. <clears throat> you know, like you were saying, the Horsemen, Dusty. I mean, just like all the names that came through there. They also came in at a perfect time. Vince McMahon had just shit the bed on TBS. And uh, Ted Turner was looking to get some real Southern wrestling back on the show. And here's this guy who's kind of slowly gobbling up little territories in the South, but not just the South. He bought a minority share in uh, the Tunney family business up in Canada. Yeah. So, you know, there were just all these little pieces. You know, when when uh, Cowboy Bill Watts was kind of losing his ass with the UWF, you know, they took that in, so they just kept building this bigger empire of pro wrestling. And like you were also saying, you could see these guys like anywhere in that territory. You know, Saturday they might be in Florida, and by Tuesday they're in Minneapolis. Yeah. You know, and they've worked you know eight days, eight dates in between as well. Yeah, and that's what I, I from what, excuse me, from what I heard, you know, in the seventies through the mid eighties, you know, they would be doing your. Um, excuse me, you know, your Greenville, South Carolina is your high point, North Carolina for your TVs. You'd be doing, you know, your Rock Hill, uh, South Carolina, right below Charlotte. Then, of course, you had your bigger towns of Richmond and, and uh, Norfolk and uh, over Virginia and then the other shows down in the Carolinas. And eventually what happened, I guess they started to expand. Uh, I know what once, as I mentioned, and I'm just, just kind of skimming over some of it, you know, they went to different parts of Tennessee. Uh, they went, which I'm not near any part of Tennessee, even though K- Kentucky does connect, but they went to parts of West Virginia. We connect to, uh, where I'm at with West Virginia and Ohio. They went to West Virginia, as I mentioned, uh, Cincinnati, Dayton, Ohio, which I mentioned. Um, and they just kept going and getting out there. And I think, and, and don't quote me on this, but if you listen to Cornette's podcast that I know we both do, I think he was running like a uh, $5 million business uh, just out of that one little office. And it'd be like all these guys would come in there and uh, when that, I don't know what day of the week it was they had meet for the TV meeting or whatever, but they had all these Cadillacs out in the parking lot. Uh, and it's just, hey, you know, all this money would be coming through there. And it's just a little office with uh, like two people and uh, two secretaries and a couple cameramen did all the boys coming and going and shooting their promos, you know. And it was just, uh, uh, they really had outgrown that. And then eventually, I guess, you know, of course, they, they bought a, a couple of airplanes and, to make it so they could make some of these towns and still still be back and ex, expand and still be back, if you will. But also, I guess, from everything I heard, and I, I again, it's just you can read it. I'm not telling any big secrets, talking out score or anything. When they started trying to go past, you know, Chicago and start heading out to California, you know, they had always done good, from my understanding, in, you know, obviously the Carolinas, Virginia. They had uh, Philadelphia and Baltimore um, up east. That was about as far up east as they went. They did, you know, drift up into Ohio and through West Virginia. So those loops all kind of made sense. Um, but then once they started going further and further, you know, out west and started going up towards, you know, Minneapolis and, and down to or over to Chicago, I should say, and then making it all the way out to doing uh, 
uh, San Francisco um, in L.A. I know they made San Francisco. I know they've done the Cow Palace on one of those loops out there. Uh, I don't know. Did they do the Olympic Auditorium when they did that loop? I'm not sure. Uh, you know what? I don't know if they did, but the the one time I met Sting, he told me that when he worked for uh, Bill Watts, they did the Olympic. Okay, okay. So, uh, but anyway, they just kept expanding so far. I guess it just got too much. You know, it got they they had outgrown that little office. And uh, that much money coming in, and then also with uh, eventually with uh, everything that, that ended up happening. I mean, we're not reinventing the wheel or giving away any secrets or spoiler alerts. We all know what eventually happens. You know, it just uh, talent left, talent came, talent left, talent came until finally it was time. I guess in '88, Ted Turner uh, bought it, bought over the NWA, um, bought Crockett out and uh, changed it to World Championship Wrestling. And um, then, of course, Vince, and then that's that. We know that. So uh, I don't want to end it on just that, that note, but we know, you know eventually what happened. But, man, for, uh, for me, and, and we agreed on this, was just, that was just one of the greatest territories yeah. or greatest places to work of all time, it would seem like. Because, you know, this, we was talking with the con- with this idea of the territory, we, we took into consideration several things, and that was, you know, were guys making money? Yes. What was the travel like? You know, how far the, some of the road trips were on some of these territories? We talked about that, and we talked about mainly um, not all the people behind the scenes because we want to give them props too, but we talked about all the talent that came through some of these territories, man, that we got to see as pro wrestling fans. It was just um it, it, it's just a great, great trip down memory uh, memory lane. I got to wrestle in Charlotte on a show called uh, Carolina Memories, and I met some of the older guys. Uh, they did a little uh, Hall of Fame induction for them. Uh, and it, it was just really, really neat to get to go to Charlotte. I got to wrestle there several times. That, that, that was the first time I got to wrestle there with the Smoky Mountain show, and they brought in several of the uh, 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 Jay shit. Uh, Jim Crockett promotion guys. They brought in uh, Sweet Hansen. Uh, I, I first met I met Magnum TA. As a matter of fact, at that point, um, uh, he was there at that show, being honored. Uh, Les Thatcher, you know, he was a voice there at one time. He, of course, he was voice of Smoky Mountain too. But he got to uh, get inducted there. Uh, uh, Sandy Scott, um, just some great people that came through there that I got to meet as. Uh, you know, just being a fan growing up and then also being one of the boys and having respect to some of the boys uh, when some of them come up to you and say, you know, oh, yeah, I've heard of you. I've seen you work. And um, I, I know they had um, that particular show. Uh, Dory Funk came up for the show. He met him several times. And, and um, of course, Terry, you know, I've got to meet him. Uh, but uh, I do remember uh, Dory driving up for that show as well on a Carolina memory. So it's been kind of a Carolina's memory on the, uh, you know, the JCP, the NWA, if you will. Uh, but, man, that, that national expansion of it, and when it went on TV and you got to watch it in syndication or whatever, however you watched it, man, whether you watched the first Starcade, uh, you know, a few years earlier, I'm sure you read about it in the magazines, and mm-hmm. you saw Shaw still shots of it on the uh, 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 show the following week and stuff, man. Um, but, yeah, once it went to Turner Broadcasting, you got to see it even more. So, yeah, it's just a great territory, and that's why it was number one for our uh, Bell to Bell Bobby Blaze podcast. Uh, so I'll let you finish up, Jeremy. Well, I, I, I'm getting a smile on my face talking about it, man. Too many good memories. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, honestly, one of the things that I thought was cool when I first discovered – you know, wrestling on TBS was, so you'd watch a show and there'd be these guys, like one guy would come in and he was the national champion and another guy would show up and he was the U S champion. And there were all these titles that gave it a sense of like, this shit is huge. You know, these guys are coming from everywhere and representing all these different championships. I mean, you didn't realize when you were young that it was because of, you know, uh, consolidation that they bought a company <laughs> that had these titles, but it, it made, it made everything feel bigger. And then you'd hear these bits about, oh, you know, Ric Flair lost the title in Japan or whoever. You know what I mean? It's yeah. not important. I'm not actually referencing something that happened. But, you know, you have guys going to Japan and all over the world and all these things. It just gave wrestling a sense of grandeur that it didn't really have anywhere else. Yeah. You know. Um, 
I, I I was a big fan as soon as I discovered it, uh, and also I liked the style more that they had. It, it was yeah. it was technical wrestling, but it was also just southern fucking haymaker throwing brawling. Yeah. Um, you know, you go back and you watch uh, Tully and Arn beat the shit out of the rock and roll in that match, and oh, it's it's just man. hard to watch. You know, you're just like, oh, it, these guys are killing them. What the. That, it, also, the other, I'll tell you another one. The Cedar Road Warriors come in and just whip the shit out of the Midnight Express. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, <laughs> that was... match, too. But, I mean, they all had their programs, and it was so legit. You know what I'm saying? Yep. That was the thing. You talk, uh, man, it was just, uh, uh, you know, you talk about Tully. Y'all. <laughs> you got Tully and R, like you said, against Ricky and Robert. And you're like, oh, my, you know, if you, of course, we cheer for the fa- uh, heels. But, you know, you're sitting there going, oh, my God, they're beating the shit out of these guys. But then I, I was a Midnight Express fan. I was, I was a huge Road Warrior fan, too, and they came. And then, of course, they set up their whole angle. They beat the shit out of Midnight Express to become champions or whatever. And then, I guess, Midnight put them out for a month while they got to go to Japan because they had an obligation there. So they put out the Road Warriors, you know, and no one put out the Road Warriors, you know, but it's just that believability. And then you had these fucking Russians, you know, yeah. my God, you had Russians? <laughs> you know, I mean, come on, man. Mean Russians, too. Oh, yeah. You know? <laughs> that was always one of my favorite threats is, you know, I'm going to win U.S. title. Take it back to Russia. You'll never see it again. Yeah. And, uh, you know, at, hell, early on, they had Wahoo, man, and, and we got to see him. Of course, he had been a little bit older then, but when any time Wahoo come out there, got to see Ernie Ladd, some of those guys, I got to see them uh, maybe in 83, 84, uh, just uh, getting to see some of those guys when they did the, um, uh, when Georgia Championship would, would switch over and do the uh, whatever, you know, NWA, the uh, JCP or whatever, you know. Yeah. Uh, and I guess they've had, you know, just just over the course of time, things change, and you want things to be, you know, like they are. But uh, you know, when you start buying all these, you, paying all these top performers, uh, and you got, you know, your own jet flying around the country, and you're trying to expand, and eventually it just all, I guess, went sour and south or whatever you want to call it and then here comes turner about and as we talked about earlier he's always said you know professional wrestling it was his first money maker for tv yep. and he would always have it on so he kept it on uh tv for as long as he could man um and that went on for a long long time of a turner product you know tbs or tnt and and um, I'm leaving out another one, I'm sure, but always had, you know, professional wrestling on there. And, of course, uh, the worldwide, they had those in syndications when Fox come along, you know, uh, yep. some of those channels. And it, it, it just, it's just a great product, too. Like you said, when you saw those guys, um, the work rate and the angles, um, I don't know if, I don't want to, I'm sure they done something stupid at one time or another, but I swear it seemed like all the angles they done was very realistic. Like there wasn't really some stupid angle, you know. Yeah. Maybe, maybe maybe the bench press contest. I don't know, but when you got them four big strong fuckers out there, they're going to lift six and seven hundred pounds or whatever. You still want to believe that too, you know? Yeah. So who didn't ever do the old arm wrestling trick or the old bench press thing? So I don't know that um, you know that they did any goof goofy angles even if they, if they uh, did I blocked them out of my mind because it's just too many good good angles and too many good memories and too many good talents that came through that territory oh yeah and look if you're going to run that much talent through you're going to have a couple dogs here and there it's just that's just the way it was uh, I always think and I hate to even bring them up I can't remember their names now they were the time traveling tag team and uh, I can't remember yeah. if they were killed or crippled they were in a horrible car wreck in their career yeah uh Chris Champion and Sean Royal. Yeah. And, yeah, and um, that was probably the dumbest one I remember, and I don't even like to talk about that one because of what happened to him. Yeah. 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 Uh, I can't even think of their tag team. I'm drawing a blank on her name. I know you're talking about. Chris recently passed away, I think, uh, sadly, just in the last few months, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah. Uh, speaking of which, we probably need to send out an RIP for the Dynamite Kid that we're recording this. He passed away a couple of days ago, as did um, at the age of 60. And uh, I'll finish by saying, uh, rest in peace, Larry the Axe Henning. I think he was 82, and he passed away in the last couple of days. I didn't even see that. I did not even yeah. catch that. So, um, just want to throw that. I want to end the show on a downer. But while we was talking about that, yeah, uh, if I'm not mistaken, um, uh, just while we was talking about it, just uh, 
you know, stay silent, hold your breath, stay silent, prayer, whatever you do or whatever, because by the time this thing broadcasts, people is going to already read and heard about it. But uh, Dynamite Kid was 60 years old, Tom, Tommy Billington, and Larry the Axe Henning was 82 years old, and he passed away this past week. So, well, yeah, yeah anyway. two, two people who were great in their day, that is for sure. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And guys, also wanted to point out real quick, I just went and put this together because it's a book I've been meaning to get around to reading as well. Uh, Bobby was talking about The Death of the Territories by Tim Hornbaker, and you can get to that by going to tinyurl.com slash blaze, D-O-T, blaze dot, and that will take you to The Death of the Territories. And uh, if you buy it, we'll get a little kickback, and we'll keep the show going. Um, and I was hoping he was going to do that. I, I threw that out there yeah. a couple of times thinking there's yet another opportunity because we've got the Dusty book out there, and now we've got the t- uh, Tim Hornbecker book out there. And go to the tiny URLs. I'll let Jeremy give it out there again because I screw him up. But go to him so he does get a little bit of kickback out of this, and that just keeps our show going, and we do so kindly appreciate it. Um, this show should be up pretty soon. Um, I don't know when. And uh, our schedules have changed. I want to say to you, uh, season's fucking greetings. <laughs> That's right. We are at the time of year when Lord Odin gets the elves and dwarves in the middle of the earth to start creating toys for all the children. He rides around on his eight-legged horse and hides them in children's wooden shoes. <laughs> if if I'm not mistaken. You're correct. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> okay yeah well with that being said uh everybody yeah. thank you for listening our, our plan is for i believe it's going to be either a saturday or sunday night release going forward um we're, we're going to be recording on weekends so i'm trying to give us enough time to get one in the bag get it edited and put it up on the same night we record the next one so that is our plan going forward hopefully we'll do it i think we'll probably end up taking the weekend of christmas off bobby i'm guessing yeah yeah yes. Um, cause I plan to be quite drunk and hiding from Lord Odin cause eight legged horses freak me out. <laughs> I'll just be trying to hide from myself, trying to, trying to outlive myself, trying to, out, as I say, I try to outlive myself, a few more other people, including myself. There you so, go. I don't um, know if you guys ever watched the, uh, the show, Are You Being Served on, uh, it played here on PBS, but it was an English show. Terribly, has not aged well, terribly racist when you go watch it now. But it had an ambiguously gay man on there, and I heard him on an interview one time where he talked about his Christmas practice was to get really drunk and fall asleep under the Christmas tree so that way there was a fairy on top and a fairy underneath. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it used to just crack me up when I'd hear that That's bit. Pretty good. Yeah. yeah. All right, Bobby. Well, thank you for All joining right. me. It has been a lot of fun. Yes, it's been I great hope, fun. Thank yeah, you. I hope everybody enjoyed these two episodes where we counted down our top ten favorite territory wrestling promotions from back in the day. Uh, if you did not, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, <laughs> what can I say? I guess this is your lump of coal for this Christmas. There you go. Yeah. Um, well, everybody, thank you for listening. We do appreciate it. We will be back soon. Uh, Bobby and I are still going to hash out what that episode is going to be, but then we will take a week off for the holidays. So for Bobby Blaze and myself, Jeremy Vilmer, bye-bye, everybody. Thanks for listening to Bell to Bell with Bobby Blaze. You can follow the show on Twitter at Bell to Bell Blaze. You can also follow Bobby on Twitter at Bobby Blaze 744 and Jeremy on Twitter at The Geekish Cast. To purchase one of Bobby's books, you can visit tinyurl.com slash blazebook1 to purchase Pin Me, Pay Me, Have Boots, Will Travel. And you can visit tinyurl.com slash blazebook2 to get I Kicked Out on 2, The Education of a Wrestler. To donate to the show's podcast hosting fees, you can visit gofundme.com slash bell-to-bell podcast hosting fees. Be sure to include a hyphen in every word in bell-to-bell podcast hosting fees. If you follow and listen to the show on Apple Podcasts, please leave a five-star review. Be sure to share the show with any wrestling fan you may know and get on the Facebook page where you can keep up with Bell to Bell fans just like you. Again, thanks for listening to the program and look for the show again next time.